Good morning. I'm not the regular preacher. I'm the irregular preacher. So I think I've got that from somewhere else. I'm not sure. You might have said it before. Hard to say. It sounds like something you'd say, Norman. So. <clears throat> My lesson today is going to be on something that's kind of um, been something that I've been kind of dealing with, and um, it's something that we're all going to deal with at some point in time in some manner or fashion, and that's being a caregiver or being taken care of. And for one reason or another, physical, mental weaknesses, um, when I was really young, I was a baby. Now, I don't remember that, but I do know that my parents took care of me. Um, sometimes I didn't think they were taking care of me well enough, but I made it into where I am now, so they must have did a pretty good job. And um, they took care of my needs, they fed me, they you know, changed me, they did all the uh, stuff that I don't remember. And then you grow up, and if you have kids, that, that's in your head because now you're realizing what your parents went through. Because now you have a child that you're having to feed, that you're having to take care of, and they can't do anything for themselves, basically. And you're their caregiver. They're not asking to be taken care of, you're just doing it because they're your child. Now, as we get older, a lot of times positions change, and we become caregivers and become taken care of as we get older. We can be get, um, when we can't long, no longer take care of ourselves, then somebody has to take care of us. A lot of times it comes down to our children. And my history is that I've had, I have four parents, three parents have already passed on. We took care of my, my own dad, my own mom, and then my wife's mom, and now we're taking care of my dad. And it's not easy. Um, and it's, um, you know, my, my dad said, and my father-in-law said, uh, you know, I don't want to be a burden to you. And my wife said, well, you're not a burden to us. And, but he is. <laughs> That's, you know, he is a burden to us. But it's a burden that we, we want to have, that we, we know that we should be having. It's a burden that he's taking care of us, we take care of him. We have to take care of each other, there's burdens. Galatians 6. We take care of our other, one another's burdens, because that is what we should do. Now, that was talking about the burdens of sin, but the application still applies. If someone has a burden, we need to take that burden on, because we are helping to take care of another person. Now, I'm a type of person that I don't like to be taken care of. I'm kind of a rugged individualist. I, you know, I could go out to the woods and stay out there for, you know, probably years without any, you know, scraping by and nobody taking care of me, you know, and I would just, I'd be kind of happy. But I'm not as happy as I am now, though, um, with my wife and uh, taking care of my kids and such like that. But um, when I'm sick, my wife is always saying, you need to get back into bed. You know, stop doing this, stop doing that. It's kind of like, yeah, but I don't, I'm not that sick. She said, okay, if you don't take care of yourself and let me take care of you, you're going to be even sicker. And you're not going to be able to do the stuff that you need to do. So I have a real hard time being taken care of. And let's not, you know, sugarcoat this. Most people that are being taken care of in some fashion or need they don't want to generally be taken care of in that fashion or need. 
They want to be able to do what they did before. And that's a hard thing on people. That's a hard thing on, your, on people's pride, um, on their self-sustainment, um, on their ability to, to think that what they used to be able to do, they can't do anymore. And, um, and I'm going to be speaking mostly from the caregiver standpoint because I haven't quite gotten to the point of being the one that's needing to be taken care of. But I know I will because I'm type 1 diabetic. Um, parts of me are going to start giving out due to my diabetes. And then my wife is going to have to take care of me and my kids. And it's, it's down the road. I mean, it's down the road for all of us. We just have to, have to think about that. And, um, but at the moment, you're probably sometimes in the caregiver position. And um, this is a rather important thing. Um, and I'm going to start at, with certain points here. I'm going to start in Matthew 6. Therefore, I say to, you, say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to a stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his, all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, and oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying what we shall eat, or what we shall drink, or what we shall wear. For after these, all these things, the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows what you need, all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient for the day and its own trouble. This is a great verse about not worrying. And when you're in the position of having to take care of someone, you worry. I mean, you go to bed worrying, you wake up worrying. Um, I go to bed um, and I wake up in the morning and I take care of my dad's needs some. I go off to work. My wife has them the rest of the day. I come home, I take over for her and give her a break. And, and you're always kind of thinking in his mind, what's, you know, what's going on? Is he doing okay? Um, it's really hard to get you know, worries out of your head. But God will take care. That's what this whole verse is about. God will take care of us, and we will take care of the things that we need to. We need to worry about... and handle the things that we can do today. Not the things that we can't do tomorrow because they aren't here yet. Not the things that were here yesterday because they've already been. Handle the things that we can do today. Let's turn to 1 Peter. Well, we've already done Matthew 6. Luke 6, 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be a measure back to you. Giving is kind of a thankless position because you give, and you're not expect, you know, you expect something to come back if you're like me, but um, a lot of times you just give. And if you're one that's being given to, you feel a sense of, well, I need to give back as well, <laughs> you know, because I've been giving too. Um, 
it's kind of an uneven relationship there. But we are told to be a giver. And the reason we're to be a giver is because, well, just think about all the things that God has given to us. God has given Jesus his son, he gave his only begotten son. You know, and we're asked to give to another person. And let's not think about what we're going to get at the moment, but realize that our giving will come back to us. In fact, that's what this says. For the, with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And this is a sense of hope in your giving. Whatever you give, God is recognizing that. God is seeing that. God is saying, that is a good thing. Give. Give more. You know, give abundantly is what, you know, Jesus constantly says through his scriptures. Give. Give. Constantly give. Give of yourself. Give of your money, if you can. Because all these things will be given back to you, not, not in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense, by God. The blessings will flow. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves its show for giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. I have a hard time with that cheerful giver thing. I'm a kind of a begrudging giver sometimes, especially when it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay giving money out so much, but, and I'm okay giving time, but when you're asked to really dig deep within yourself and give something that, you know, you're not sure the person, other person is going to appreciate, they may not be there, and this is a caregiver to a parent. They, they may not be there mentally to, you know, appreciate, but they are appreciating it. I mean, it's, they're just not verbally saying it, but they are appreciating it. And everybody that you give to appreciates it generally on some level, unless they're just totally selfish. But we need to realize that, again, we need to be as cheerful as we can because of the hope that God is bestowing upon us in the future. Having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. God is going to give us what we need to perform what we need to do. Do good. Galatians 6. Nine through ten. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. This is one of my favorite verses, because it's very straightforward. Do good. And it doesn't tell us, it doesn't say, do good like this, do good like this, do good like this, do good like this. It says, do good. So that basically leaves what we're supposed to be doing wide open, right, towards towards other people. Again, do good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. God's going to give back to us for what we do good towards other people. Do good, especially to those who are the household of faith. And this especially applies to your family. I know a lot of my family is kind of like, ah, yeah. You know, I know the restaurants, come in, we'll treat you like family. Well, I don't want to be treated like family. I want to be treated better than family. Um, some, of, you know, some of your relatives are kind of really hard to um, you know, wrap your head around of, as far as really wanting to do good towards them. But, and yet, we need to. 
Now, sometimes the good is not giving, just kind of like our children, sometimes good is not giving a person everything that they want, but giving them what they need. And that is our goal, to give people what they need, what they need to survive, and what they need to move towards God. Do good. And this is, and this is with, as opportunity. Again, this shouldn't put the worry on us. As we have the opportunity, do good. Compassion, giving, Matthew 9. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. And this is Jesus. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. He saw their weaknesses. He saw the problems that were before him. And Jesus was moved with compassion. In fact, we'll find this often, a lot of times, I think 15 times when Jesus is doing miracles and healing, the word compassion is used in that. Jesus had compassion towards the people around him because they were in a position to need it. They were in a position of weakness. They were being oppressed by the Roman government. Um, unless you were a high-ranking person in the Jewish um, priest or rulers, you really didn't have much power and you didn't really have, you know, you're basically the common people. And, and you're even less of the common people. A lot of people, you know, Jesus healed those that were sick, those leprosy was present. I mean, there's a whole lot of issues that we don't have to deal with that these people back in this time dealt with every day. Food, lack of food, um, you know, the prayer for their need was shelter, clothing, and food. The three basic needs. And these were things that were present and continually present in their lives all the time. We're going to turn to Luke 10. Uh, let's see here. Verse 30. And I'm not going to read this too much. Um, well, yeah, I am. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and saw him, and he had compassion. So went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and whatever you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? As we always talk about, well, you know, the two guys didn't help at all. Well, let's think about the one guy that did help. He helped because he had compassion on the person that couldn't help himself. This is, the, time, this is the, the place that we're often in. As parents to our child, they can't help themselves, so we have to help them. As children for our parents, or for our, even our spouse. I mean, Don's being taken care of home you know, by Tracy right now. Um, I hope she's taking really good care of him. We need him back. Um, but we all step into that role of being a caregiver at some point in time for someone, whether it's our spouse, whether it's our parents, whether it's our children. And we have to take care of their needs. One of the really hard things to do during this time is have peace. Second Thessalonians 3.16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace, always in every way, the Lord be with you all. Going back to that anxiety, you know, issue and uh, worry, it's kind of like, 
when, you're, when, you, when it's you and your wife, things run along pretty smoothly usually. But when it's you and your wife and someone else, you know, there's something else going on besides just you and your wife. And when you have that other person that is having difficulties, then now what you would be directing towards each other is now usually both of you are being directed towards this other person. And um, peace is really hard to find. But we have to remember that God will supply us peace. We find peace through Christ. We find peace through God. We can put our cares, that is what prayer is all about. Putting our cares, giving our cares to God. Letting him step in and take care of us. We don't put enough, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't put enough value in prayer and do it enough. But we need to pray more because God is there. He, he does care for us. Love. 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not pray to itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity. But rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. Love is con different from, from compassion. Compassion is the driving force to our action. Love is the action. Love is what we do. Love suffers long. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not pray to itself. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Rejoices in truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. One of my hard parts in this is being kind. I'm not a very gracious caregiver. I'm, I'm kind of a rough caregiver. My wife will help my father-in-law out of his chair and, you know, do it gently. Me, I'm kind of like, okay, let's go. And, and I've got the, the strength to do it. So I can, I can basically, uh, he's a pretty big guy, and, but I can, I can move him if I want to. And uh, unfortunately, I don't often do it with the right gentleness that I need to do. We have to keep in mind that, you know, this isn't a package you're, you know, lifting up and moving. This is another person. This is a person that has feelings. This is a person that is like you, um, that deserves the love that you give them. Um, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta not only suffer through what's going on from them. You have to suffer through your own self. Um, it's, it's not easy to, you know, step back and think, okay, whoa, I gotta, you know, I gotta do this the right way. I have to, I have to be more calm. I have to be more collected. I have to show more gentleness. Um, I don't have, you know, I shouldn't think about time so much as making sure that the other person is getting what they need. And like I said, that's it's kind of a real hard thing for me because I, I just want to, you know, get it done with and get it over with and let's move on to the next step. Um, which leads us to patience. James 1, 1 through 4. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing, testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its work, perfect work, that you may be perfect to complete, lacking nothing. The testing of your faith produces patience. And my faith gets pretty tested when I'm, you know, when I'm in those certain situations. Even when I was taking care of my little children, it's kind of like, okay, come on, we've got to get this done. Um, I don't, I'm not really great at patience in certain things, uh, especially when I think another person can do it themselves or should be able to do it. And yet, in my head, I know that that's not really the case. Um, 
because if, if and when I'm down, I'm not going to be able to do some things that I know I should have, I could probably have done, and I'm going to have to have somebody have patience with me. Everything that you do towards another person will come back to you. We then, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak, because that is what we're dealing with. And not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, as is written, the approaches of those who reproached you fell on me. But whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we may through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the may of the God, God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded towards one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may be one mind and one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Patience and comfort. We often think of patience. Well, here he uses the words patience and comfort. And through these, we might have hope. So we need to think of a little bit further down the road as far as how we apply our patience, you know, because a lot of times we run out of patience because it has to do with our comfort. When we're at the drive-thru, I, I want my food and I want it now. We, we've, you know, we're out of our patience because we didn't think we deserve our food and we want it right now. Well, it may take longer than we expect. But it runs our comfort level when we're, you know, when we're expecting something and it doesn't happen the way we want it to or in the time matter that we want it to. This is where it comes down to not pleasing ourselves. And the strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. Because we, at one point, will be weak. And we are weak. We're weak and we may be weak physically, but we're going to have spiritual weaknesses, moments of weaknesses. Um, depression, uh, times when, you know, we just aren't thinking clearly. We're going to have to have people bear with us. And I'm going to finish with Galatians 6. If I can find it. There we are. Oh, that's not what I was wanting. Uh, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a great verse. Let's read it in context. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at, least, now at last your care for me has flourished again. He's, Paul's writing to the Philippians that their care for him has flourished. So Paul is being taken care of. Most of a lot of time in his later years he was in prison but he still had caregivers, whether it was through prayer or people visiting him. Your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. So a lot of times they weren't able to do it simply because they weren't there. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, I know how to be abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When we're in a point of being in need, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us because he is there. We're, when we're in time of being the caregiver, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us because God is there. 
is always present. And I'm going to follow this up with Once, when we read through the Old Testament, we see God taking care of the Gentiles. I mean, sorry, the Jews. Um, even, in, even in the roughest times, you know, even when they said, oh, we don't want you anymore, God, God still took care of them. He made it, may have, um, you know, chastised them and, and brought them back into the realization that, you know, God was there and, you know, God was going to take care of them, but God was there. It's a pattern. God is the ultimate caregiver. He still is. Jesus sent his son to die for us because he cares for us, because God is the epitome of giving. God gave us his son. Jesus gave everything. There's a song, I forget how it goes. Uh, few gave all, uh, all gave some, something to that effect. One gave all. He gave his life. He lived a life for us. He still lives. He rose and died and uh, died and rose and is still living for us as our intermediate. When we pray, we go through Christ, and God says, God, and Jesus says, God, this is what he's saying. He's, he's basically playing the you know, part, part of Abraham that Abraham played for the Jews. He's saying, you know, have mercy, have grace, because these people are, you know, they're doing the best they can, but, you know, they're weak. And as long as they're you know, approaching you and approaching me and giving us the, the glory that we deserve, you know, God is going to provide us with the things that we need. But God is only going to provide us with the things that, that we need if God knows who we are. And that comes down to the fact that if we're going to be under God's will, be under God's command, have the things that God wants to give to us, we need to be godly. If we're not in Christ, we need to be in Christ. The invitation is always open. The invitation is always open for us to be a different person, be more godly than we were yesterday, be who we ought to be tomorrow, be a caregiver, we must realize that God has taken care of us. I praise you with all.